at Bradley Mech on Twitter, Bradley Mech on pretty much everything. You can kind of guess, and I'm probably there. I work at a platform as a service company as a developer operations, senior dev, so basically tooling out infrastructure and systems. So I don't get to see too much of the front end, but there's more of this related to the back end, at least in my opinion, than front end does on average, a lot less on design and more about systems. So uh, first things first, offline. We don't always have connectivity in uh, the normal situations that we have our everyday lives. 3G may fail. You may be at Starbucks and you can't get a connection. You may be at a conference and be unable to hold a connection to Wi-Fi, for example. Uh, but there's also one that people don't think about. It's when your website actually goes down. Have you ever noticed that Gmail, even when it goes down, you can still navigate to the website? Same with Google Groups. Same with most of the Google sites. They're actually just running app cache and updating as they please. So it's really hard for users to even tell that their website's down. So they're basically cheating, and you should cheat too. Um, that's the way this works. Basically, we're going to take features, we're going to talk about situations you may not understand, and then we're going to actually do some live coding for this whole presentation. And the biggest one, the evil one, is the application cache. This is your entry point to an offline application. This is what's going to make it survive a refresh. And it solves what I call the Starbucks problem. I work at Starbucks pretty much every weekday. It's awesome until I'm sitting there posting some evil form that I've filled out, and I see this. This is, this is dread. Um, <clears throat> and this is how I started to actually learn about the application cache in depth. Because I was wondering why I would navigate to all the Google sites and I could never get this. I could never connect to the internet because I could never click I agree and then connect. Because Google hides that away from you with the application cache. So be wary of what you're doing, but also understand you can make it through hell if you have an application cache manifest. Um, so we're going to discuss that. So support. It's pretty widely supported. IE, I mean, nine and below, IE's mobile market share isn't too big, and that's your main point. But IE 10 has it. Um, there are no known polyfills for below that, but there are some really weird things you can do with offline applications where you have to include your own kind of proprietary manifest, but the user has to download it to their computer. So not quite the same thing. But pretty much everywhere, this is supported. It's usable in the real world. And you're not going to harm yourself doing it if you do it right. So basically, the good thing. It serves content without a connection. So it's just pulling off disk the whole time. It will never go to the network unless you tell it to go to the network. Um, tooling has started to show up, particularly Grunt, uh, which is basically a build automation tool built on top of Node, lets you automatically generate your application manifest so you don't do things uh, that are bad, which we're going to talk about. Uh, they also have an interesting thing I've never found an actual use for. They have a fallback. So if you can't access a specific file because you're offline, it can fall back to a local file that it has saved. I've never found an actual use for it, but I'm sure there is one. And then the bad. Whatever you do, do not mention do not speak of your application manifest inside of your application manifest. All nightmares break out, and we're going to show you one. Um, things break. 
Things that you don't expect to break. Ajax stops working entirely. Um, your site may never be able to be reloaded by the average user. You could cache your cache and tell it never to hit network again when looking up your cache. That's bad. Um, so be careful and don't ever talk about your application manifest inside of itself. Also, it's an aggressive cache. It is, if you've ever tried to shift command R, shift control R, and seen the web page not actually reload, this is worse. This actively tries to stop it from reloading. So, that's bad, but it's not too bad. You're gonna hit two refreshes instead of one. Um, and we're gonna discuss why. And it's an all or nothing cache. So you can't take some parts of your cache offline. So you can't take part of an image gallery offline. You take the whole image gallery offline or you take none for the application cache. And this is separate from other storage techniques. We're going to discuss them. Lots to talk about. So how do we do this? It's pretty simple. Um, it's an attribute on your HTML tag. It just says manifest equals anything you want, but it's a file. Um, so this file has to be served as a text cache manifest. Browsers will ignore it otherwise, and it only will update your cache if that file changes. So if you update your files, it's not gonna update the manifest. So the users won't see any changes. So a common technique, pretty much everyone has started doing it, put a timestamp in there with your build tool. Like, simple, easy, automated. And then uh, once you set the location of your manifest, good luck changing it. So pick it wise. Um, there are ways around it, but I'm not gonna talk about it, it's not worth it. No, no, like right here. Uh, so this is an example that I'm actually using on the site we're going to. It's auto-generated by a build tool in Grunt. Uh, says that up at the top. It's got a time. As long as that continuously changes every time you build, the application cache will be updated on all your clients. If that wasn't there and all it said was that comment in the list of files, if I change index.html, the application cache doesn't give anything about that. It doesn't see a new application cache manifest. It doesn't care. So in some ways, that's bad. But in other ways, it's good. So if you update your index.html, you can purposefully only hit people who are online. Um, you could use it for really weird A-B testing. I wouldn't do it. Uh, did you have a question? No? Okay. So we're gonna show you some nightmares. Do, do, do. Whoa. So, first thing you guys should know. This is how you're gonna clear your app cache. It's always hidden behind flags in different browsers. It's at different locations. It's not in your tools. It's not when you say clear everything from the beginning of time. It's not gonna clear it anywhere except for these little pages you have to look up the location to. In Chrome, it's Chrome app cache internals. So there's nothing in it right now. We can refresh, we can refresh. I'm slash, on slash dot here, you know. But the previous page I was on had an app cache. this. So at the top here, when you get an application cache coming into your application, everybody's going to log just out the wazoo what's happening. It's kind of nice. You can see it's pulling down all these files. And in general, it appears to be working. You're good. And then we go over here. We've got this little 
61K. That's the size of our entire site in the cache. Ooh, that doesn't, let's, there we go. So basically now, if I go and update anything on that site without updating the application manifest, it doesn't care. It will never see the update until I update that manifest. So, unfortunately, I'm on a different computer, so I can't swap to it. But I can go update index.html and just comment out the entire thing, and nothing is going to change. Save Go over here, refresh. That's a blank file on my server, which is cool. Like, the server's down. Like, there's nothing good going on in the server, but the user's still able to do some stuff. He's able to look at things, at least. And even XHR works. If it's in the app cache, the browser's convinced it exists in the internet. So that's good, right? So let's go back and uncomment this and start to show you nightmares. Uh, so first things first. Let's tell the manifest that the manifest should only be accessed on the network. So you should never cache your cache. Here. Whoa, wrong. So refresh. So it pulled down a new cache. So it downloaded everything. Looks cool. We have in our network app.app cache. So Everything should work the same, right? We're only talking about the manifest. Well, no. So XHR works on the current page we're at. XHR to slash pictures, which should work, is just going to start blowing up. Oh, that's interesting. Either way, uh, while doing this presentation last night, we got the app cache into a state where I could not get to that. XHR had stopped. There's a big talk on the flowchart of how app cache works. It's in a talk called uh, App Cache is a Douchebag from JSConf last year. I can't discuss that flowchart. That was an entire hour and a half talk on how to determine the state of your app cache. So if you want to know more about it, you can look it up there. So let's go and just clear this again. But in general, don't put this here. There are certain situations where that means Ajax stops working. Uh, don't mention your app cache. It's bad. Yeah. So that's all the app cache does. It just makes it so you can use XHR and you can pull files down. So that's kind of nifty, but it's not a complete solution to anything we need to do. So let's start talking about features. So often, we want to upload an image or something. We want to get the user to send stuff to us and the server to handle it. Well, in HTML5, we don't need the server to handle file uploads anymore. The file API is what that's about. Basically, the file API lets you uh, take 
an input that's of a file type, and you can get the raw data out of it. Works in Firefox, works in Opera, works in WebKits. So it's pretty well supported. IE 10 has mostly support for it. I haven't used that, though, and it looks like it's not entirely supported according to the graph. But IE 10 is still release candidate. It'll be fixed. So it's starting to get to a usable state. So awesome. You can read the files. You cannot write. So you can pull data down without a server. And you can pump these as data URIs. You can actually make people download this file that they're uploading by opening it in a new window. So like the old window.open tricks, they apply here. The bad. It doesn't stream. It's going to buffer the entire file into your JavaScript. It, if you upload a 10 meg image, that's 10 megs of RAM extra that your web page is using. It won't wait for it. It won't do any sort of back pressure. It's not smart, but it works. So when talking about this image editor, that's how we're uploading images here. Basically, instead of going to the server, we're going to hit upload image, and we're going to pull it straight off the file system. So on the desktop, I got this awesome picture. It's nice, you know. So, and that never hit the network. If we go, and you're really paranoid, there's everything being pulled down from app cache. Go here we see a blob. It's not actually pulling it off of any sort of server. It's using blob URIs as we pull it out of the HTML input. So this is awesome to me. This means we can actually start getting users to do things offline. This is one of the features that the server used to do exclusively that we can start to do now. So that's good. Uh, can I view source? Oh, I'm on the wrong computer for this. Sources. Ah, oh, it's bundled. So. Slash JavaScript slash source slash. Cool. So we have a bunch of these nifty little things. But this is all we're doing. How do I zoom on you? There we go. Basically, when an upload action fires, we just grab the file. It's got a list of files. So you can still do multiple uploads at once. Um, if it's got the file, we grab the blob. You have to do a dot slice there, which is a little redundant, but it works. And then we transfer it to a data URI, to an image, and print it out to the canvas so we can actually start editing it. Um, if you're not familiar with data URIs, they're generally going to explode if you try to do something too large. So don't like try to upload an ISO with this. Uh, IE doesn't like things more than 32K in size, so it won't like images. They're fixing that in 10, so cool. There are a few polyfills for this in Flash. So it's still doable even if you don't have HTML5. But the data URIs are not doable. So you can't, for this example, print it out to the canvas. So there's some code. Anybody have questions? We're moving on. Cool. 
So this is going to start to get even more confusing. So there's the file API, and there's the file API, file system API. Well, so the file system API, instead of letting you access files individually, is talking about giving you basically a virtualized file system, like your C drive, your root on Unix. You can actually create a file system and persist files there with permissions for the end of time, basically. And it was made for a couple of reasons, mainly that local storage was found to be inadequate for persistent storage. So support, it's all Chrome right now. And we got a BlackBerry 10, though. Uh, I was actually really impressed that BlackBerry had it. Um, BlackBerry is not really known for the JavaScript API support. Awesome CSS, though. Uh, so there's a cache, though. Anything that supports IndexedDB has a polyfill for the file system API. Anything that supports Web SQL has a polyfill for IndexedDB. And it goes on for a little while in various places. Like, you can get this supported down to IE8 with polyfills. The performance is going to tank, though, but it'll work. And I think working is important. So as I was talking about, there are tons of polyfills, polyfills that just go on forever. Um, also, lots of storage. If you want to save ISOs, this is how you do it. Literally, for the session storage you can get on this, Chrome doesn't even limit you. As long as you do not consume up to 80% uh, of total disk space left, it won't stop you. So you can just pipe to disk forever. So don't do that. Users will hate you. Um, and it's got first class blobs. So I was talking about data URIs before. Like, this doesn't convert things to weird string encodings. This is, you're actually talking with bits. Like, it's awesome. It's what typed arrays are about, and it's really the exciting stuff for me. But it's bad. It's, it's, it's crazy complex just to get a file system. Uh, there are a lot of constants involved. If you've ever worked with WebGL, it's like if WebGL and Lisp had a baby. So you're constantly nesting things where you're sharing context with arguments and objects. It's not good. Um, there are some shims that fix this. They're all based off the Node File System API. If you care for that, it mostly works. Uh, there are a few things with permissions that don't work right, like you can't do sim links in this. So you, you take what you can. But uh, so the File System API, it's cool. Um, I'm not really going to go into it because that would take a long time. We're going to move on to other caching technologies that we actually use, stuff that's good. So local storage API. This is probably the most frequently used things. It's on your iPhone. It's on your Android device. It's on anything that you may want to store some temporary data. It's basically super cookies. Like, you get 25 megs of storage on average. That's plenty for most things to store settings, save files for games, text for inputs that needs to be saved temporarily. And it's supported everywhere. Opera Mini doesn't count. So what? It's everything that cookies was supposed to be. Uh, basically, you have session storage, if you only want to stay alive for the browser. You have permanent storage, which is called local storage. We're going to talk about that. And it's synchronous. It's simple to use. There's no nesting of functions. And basically, that's what this is going to give you. It's good. Even if 
it's not supported. If you're talking IE55, there are polyfills for it. This is something that has been made. It's, it's done. Like, you can support this. I don't care how far you go back. Um, also, performance. Just to talk here, people complain about CommonJS for its synchronous stuff. This is a synchronous API. It'll slow you down if you use it everywhere. So be cautious about it. It's still going to be way faster than hitting the network, though. Uh, bad. <clears throat> it's slow. You're actually going to cause jitters on your page if you use it with big chunks. And it's limited storage. You got 25 megs. It's probably big enough. <clears throat> but basically, it's a simple key value store. You have local storage, which is the name of the API and the name of the object you want to use. You can get item. You can remove stuff, uh, set item, all that good things that you'd expect. But you can only save JSON-compatible objects. Like, you're not going to store a function on disk. That's true for all of these technologies. They want to be saved to disk. They aren't going to keep your state when you save them there. Um, but you can modify items and push them back in. So yes, you'll lose your context, though. So you'll lose your closure. Um, there are actually a lot of web worker APIs which have persistent state for that. And I think it's less. Yes, less will actually compile your less, save it in local storage, and pull it out instead of recompiling every time. So it's being used for interesting stuff. I don't think CoffeeScript has it yet. The CoffeeScript interpreter in the browser still goes all the way. Yeah. Whoa. So. Look right. Good enough. So basically, when we're going around here, we've got this draw free hand. I mean, this is the simplest use case I could find for things. So we've selected draw free hand, but we haven't done anything about it. And when we refresh, it's no longer selected. If you've got a large selection of tools, say you're doing something medical where there are checkboxes everywhere, that's painful. Um, I've worked with a chiropractic software way back in the day, and there were like 50 checkboxes. If you hit any sort of refresh, people would just get upset and angry. So, Basic idea is simple. Since I'm on a different computer, we're just going to do this live coding style. So local storage dot set item. For tool pin. Saved tool. We've saved it. We're going to refresh the page, lose all that. App cache is still working. And it's going to persist. So that's cool. That's, that's kind of nifty. But what happens if you hit private browsing mode and go there? Well, first off, you'll notice the app cache. Everything in private browsing, instead of doing shift controls, shift command R, shift command N. 
it'll pop you into a private browsing window. All the caches are reset. They get their own private temporary ones. So the same is true when we want to go over here. I mean, it's null. There's nothing awesome about it. So that's cool. So how do we actually keep stuff persisted? Well, we do that. But what if we don't want to save something? What if it's a one-off, like you've entered a form? There's another one called session storage. So session storage, that's set item. It's going to act just like a cookie. Uh, so we have two things saved here. We have hi there and get item. In case you guys don't know, please look at the resources. It's got pretty much everything you're going to want to do here. So local storage, and then session storage. But when we refresh the page, the session storage is going to stay the same. However, if we close the browser, it's going to go away. So let's close the browser entirely. Chrome's closed. I'm sorry for having this just be browser windows, but I can't show caching behavior otherwise. So high is null, but save tool remained from local storage. These are your tools that you have when you're building out an image gallery. And these are how I started to work things out. So we're running short on time. I'm just going to show some code here really fast. JavaScript source fs. Um. Yeah, I've got to get used to that. Is that big enough? So basically what we have here is we've used dependency, I've used dependency injection in this editor, and I was going to show you stuff if I had time. I had less than I hoped. Basically, we have a REST-based system. It's just using some XML, HTTP requests, you know, standard stuff, pulling down and pasting the image out. Uh, and then we have this. It's one of those polyfills for the file system API that wraps it in a nicer API. This one matches the Node API exactly. So if I wanted, instead of saving out to the server, to save to my local disk on the client's machine, on whoever was uploading the image, I would swap out for this. and just create the streams or files as I need them. Um, this is exactly the same file as what I'm using on my server, except for these two lines. This one would be just require fs, and this one is a little hack because of a bug. So I've got a purely isomorphic place by abstracting out this image implementation. So 
We're really short on time, but does anybody have questions, ideas, concerns, things that they are worried about? Uh, it looks like I'm being shuffled out, so.